everyone. It is so good to see you all here today. Thank you for joining us. Um, as you're logging on, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat um, and let us know your connection to coaching or your interest in coaching in early learning settings. Um, we'd love to know who we have in the room and, and why you chose to join us today. And we'll get started in a few minutes as folks continue to log on. Awesome, so we have several coaches with us. We love to see coaches, welcome. Wisconsin, New Jersey, Michigan. It's always exciting to see folks across the country join us. Alaska, ooh, Alaska, Colorado, Brooklyn, awesome. DC, I was in DC for a long time. I love DC. Um, wonderful. All right, thank you all for being here. Keep these answers coming in. Um, we're just curious who's all here today and your interest in early childhood coaching or your connection to early childhood coaching. So please feel free to share. Thank you all so much. Okay, so without further ado, we have a packed kind of webinar to get to today. So we will go ahead and get started. My name is Annie Schaefing. I'm the Director of Policy and Strategic Advisement for the Learning Starts at Birth team at Bay Street's Education Center. And I'm really excited to welcome you all to this webinar today. Um, which marks the release of our latest publication, which is a framework for coaching in early childhood settings. As someone in the chat mentioned, this got rescheduled um, after a few of us were sick with COVID, but now we are recovered and ready to go and excited to be here today. Um, so our framework that, that we've shared draws on Bank Street's developmental interaction approach and represents a synthesis of our core values and approaches to educator development when you apply that in a coaching context. The goal of our session today is to introduce you to the basic tenets of the framework. So we'll kind of do an overall review of the framework work itself. And then we're going to get to engage in a really rich discussion with several different Bing Street experts as they talk about how to apply this framework in both practice and policy settings. So we're excited to dig in. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Bank Street, we have been around for over 100 years, um, and we're really focused on how children learn and what educators need in order to help children succeed. You might be familiar with our Graduate School of Education, which is based in New York City and is a national leader in educator preparation. Um, we also have a few direct service programs, including a family center that serves families with children from six months to five years old and a Head Start program as well. And in addition to kind of this direct service and our graduate school, Bank Street is also committed to connecting our expertise in order to impact policy and practice at scale across the country. And we do that through the Education Center, which is what houses Learning Starts at Birth, which is the team that I'm on. And so for Learning Starts at Birth, this is kind of an illustration um, of our vision for change. Um, our focus is really on creating more equitable childcare systems through stronger investments in the infant toddler educator workforce. Um, our efforts focus kind of simultaneously on these four um, recommendations that you see pictured on the screen here in order to support, attract, and retain a diverse and highly qualified workforce so that all young children have access to developmentally meaningful experiences. And so in order to really realize these recommendations at scale, we believe that educators at all different experience levels um, need and deserve access to really high quality ongoing professional learning. And part of that, a central part of that approach at Bank Street is really 
grounded in bridging theory and practice through job embedded support. And so coaching is a key way to do this. Um, when it's done well, it can be a really critical investment for early childhood systems um, in order to help teachers continue to improve their practice. Um, at its best, we believe that coaching has the potential to be transformational for teachers and educators. Um, while building a trusting relationship over time, coaches help educators activate and better articulate their previous knowledge, skills, and values, along with new concepts. Coaches help educators construct and continually refine an approach that's meaningful in their everyday work, thereby improving teacher practice over time. Um, and the ideas presented today really synthesize Bank Street's values into an approach to coaching that can be applied across different contexts and different environments. So without further ado, I am thrilled to introduce Virginia Casper, a developmental psychologist and teacher educator who has served in multiple roles within Bay Street's Graduate School of Education, including as an advisor, an instructor, and dean of the graduate school. We also have with us Millie Gonzalez, um, who was a senior director in the Bay Street Education Center, leading professional development projects with districts and states across the country. Millie is now vice president of New York programs at All Our Kin, and she has managed the implementation of large-scale coaching partnerships for Bank Street with different uh, public sector districts. We also would love to introduce Christina Satchel, who is a graduate of the Infant and Family Development and Early Intervention Program at Bank Street College, and has worked as an educator, adjunct professor, and fieldwork supervisor, um, as well as an early childhood consultant for Bank Street over the past 12 years. Um, she's also worked as a QI specialist in New York City and has held leadership roles in early Head Start programs as well. And she currently works at Educational Alliance, where she's the director of their home-based program. So we have three folks here with diverse depth of experience, and we're so happy that they've joined us. Um, we also want to thank everyone who provided feedback on our framework. Um, from our graduate school, Carmen Colon, Margie Brickley, and Peggy McNamara, and from our education center, Davia Brown Franklin, um, as well as Gretchen Ames of the Build Initiative. So thank you all for, for your feedback. Um, as you've heard in their descriptions, each of our presenters bring a really deep understanding of Bank Street's approach when applied of, in different contexts. Um, and so we're gonna begin today's conversation by really sharing with you the fundamental principles that underlie the framework um, that connect to Bank Street's core beliefs. And then we'll preview the four major components of the framework. And then finally, we'll open up for a panel discussion with our experts here um, in a series of discussion questions that are really aimed at illuminating the complexity of the tool and the power of the tool when you use it in action. And finally, we will be saving time at the end for audience questions. So please, um, as they come up, feel free to drop questions in the chat. And then at the end, we'll, we'll pull some questions to ask our panelists. So. Without further ado, I am going to turn the discussion over to Millie. Thank you for that introduction, Annie. I'm really excited to be here with you all today to discuss a coaching framework. I myself uh, was a coach for a really long time and coaching is one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, as part of our orientation to the framework, uh, it's important to highlight that it's not a rubric or an evaluation. Our framework really outlines an approach that fits in with a variety of coaching models. And in our time together, we'll be walking you through how this tool can be used to enhance your coaching. We've developed this framework using the developmental interaction approach, which is also known as the DIA, as Annie mentioned, which is really a synthesis of what we believe to be key to good coaching. Some of the terms and language you might have heard, and some of the ideas uh, might not be as new. But what we will do is thread these ideas together to have a better understanding of how this framework supports coaching. The purpose of our coaching framework, as mentioned in the framework itself, is that coaches help educators activate and better articulate their previous knowledge, their skills, their values, and belief systems to construct a philosophy from which they can approach their work. A process that is especially vital when educators are faced with dilemmas of practice. Coaching frameworks like ours to provide an opportunity for practitioners and coaches such as uh, ourselves to consider and apply ideas and approaches that make sense for any given situation. This framework is one that we've used in our coaching work at scale in New York City. 
We've also used it, used it in pre-K programs and in family child care programs, as well as when our work with students at the graduate school. And so to further discuss how the genesis of this framework really connects to the DIA, I'll pass it over to Virginia, who will go into the key principles. Thank you, Millie. I have to say, it's just been amazing to be a part of this project and now the rollout. Um, and I just want to echo what you said, Millie, about some of this may look familiar. And you know that's a good thing. Um, and it's important to know that a lot of the ideas that we'll talk about here today originated at various times in the 20th century, and not only by Bank Street, but Bank Street has really developed them, I would say, in a consistent and integrated way and continues to refine them. Um, so stay tuned. <laughs> Um, the big one is really that education is not value free. <clears throat> and, you know, I think we'd all agree, but um, it's not really true out there in the world for most people. Um, it's a way we see to encourage democracy and social justice. And given the state of our democracy today, thank goodness the foremothers knew this. Um, we don't want our society to remain stagnant and we want everyone to have a voice. And speaking of the foremothers, they were uh, prescient also um, in terms of uh, how emotions and thinking are always interacting. How did they know this um, before neuroscience did? <laughs> well, um, they were astute observers. And in the last 40 years, neuroscience has proven them to be, their knowledge to be accurate. And clearly a relationship-based approach is grounded um, in that knowledge. Another tenant is that um, about good child and adult development being the basis for how we make those observations. We say all behavior has meaning, but we don't wanna to jump to conclusions about that. We wanna weigh what we see with what we know and confer with other educators, family members, really anyone who knows the child. Uh, this next principle seems pretty obvious, but making it a true part of our practice is not so easy. Um, for example, how many educators that you know spend time in the community in which they teach if they themselves don't live there? Um, this one is inquiry-based learning is, is more of a well-known term. Um, and although children and adults don't learn in exactly the same way, we know there are some universals. And one is that when a learner engages in discovery, we believe it promotes deeper and longer lasting learning. And then finally, um, another way to say this last principle is that the learning goal for educators and coaches is a key learning goal, is to become a student of one's own practice. And that's a direct quote from a student in one of our programs that was in East New York. So we've worked these principles into four basic pillars that we believe really organize the framework. And obviously they're all connected. Um, it's not a laundry list. Um, ways of being relates to how you are in the world, in your work, with yourself. Um, development, identity, and culture relates to who you are and how you reflect on how the experiences that have shaped you in the world and in your work and how you use that knowledge to push forward. And both educator practice and the complexities of the coaching ecosystem, that's a mouthful, they both relate to what you do when you coach. Um, and we named the last one the way we did, even though it's a mouthful, to really highlight the tremendous pressures on educators from families, communities, from systemic racism, climate-based disasters. And unfortunately, the list keeps getting longer. Um, to look at each pillar in a little more depth, um, a key part of ways of being is to help um, coaches learn or remember the ways in which every relationship affects every other relationship or what we call parallel process. Many of you know this term, um, which is uh, the main avenue to make our work really transformational. Um, also key is being flexible and showing authentic curiosity about an educator and their work. And again, this seems obvious, but um, remembering what they tell you in previous sessions and being able to draw on it naturally, not only looking at your notes. And how do we do that 
in our busy lives with such competing demands, mental demands especially. Um, and one thing is just clearing your head before coming into a program and spending time off site, really holding that educator and her practice in mind. Basically, we got to slow down. <laughs> it's not so easy. I'm even talking faster than I want to, to <laughs> make this work time wise. Um, but of course, one of the most difficult attitudes to counter is being judgmental because most of us have had judgmental experiences in education. And thinking purposefully about our way of being helps us cultivate a non judgmental, strength based approach. Asking probing questions, not dictating commenting on what you see like powerful interactions great i notice statements and modeling thoughtful practice like you can take notes on a small pad to help you reflect off site but you can also share those observations with the coachee um, a fundamental part of who you are you won't be surprised to learn is reflective practice or, or reflective processes uh, try not to use supervision word because it has it can conjure up some <laughs> a range of experiences for different people let's just say that and ultimately we hope that educators can encode reflective processes into their own ways of being mm -hmm. something that we found can help educators understand the need for reflection is having a really solid grasp of just how different birth to three and birth to five age groups are from older children and why and how their behaviors pull so deeply on our inner emotional selves that sometimes we just don't even know what's happening. We just feel something really intense. Uh, it takes a while to unpack. Um, sharing how you work with other coaches to reflect on your practice models to the coaches how you learn from others. And there are ways to model and demystify reflective practice, such as saying, you know, I was thinking about what you said last week, and it made me wonder, <laughs> you know, or um, talking about how you change your mind about something in your practice. Um, but as I said, the, a, a key, one of the key things to reflective practice is just how hurried all our schedules have become. And I think we have to together advocate and insist on changing that. And finally, it's just so important to trust in the process. It takes courage, but it's really essential. So the second pillar, um, and I'm going to try and move through this a little faster, is um, how we've reflected um, on who we are in the world um, and hopefully how we've changed. It's about self-awareness of our you know, racial, ethnic, economic experiences, our biased influences on our perceptions, often unconsciously, right? which can make noticing, for example, the difference between our intentions and the actual impact they have on people, difficult to be aware of. Making assumptions, not asking, but telling are practices that require a lot of work to erase, especially for those of us um, in roles that are considered knowing positions. Um, and, you know, coaching is really needs to be a partnership of learning. And my pet peeve, a key but neglected aspect is um, thinking about where coaches are in their adult development. And we know that research shows that most educator preparation in this country don't emphasize child or adult development, or I should say adult develop, adult child, Never mind. Okay, coaches can ask questions that help teachers use the development they do have and find out more in case they aren't sure what might or might what might not be developmentally based. And again, we don't want to use developmentally bl development blindly or rigidly, but really just as a guide to learn more. So Millie, I'm going to turn it back to you for educator practice. Thank you, Virginia. And this is a great segue into the next pillar of the framework, which really digs into educator practice. And this section covers the ways in which we support educators in their goal setting and ongoing growth within their practice. So whether a program uses a fixed curriculum or the educator creates their own learning activities, the day-to-day -day experiences of young children need to be responsive to their interests and abilities and their learning needs. When we do this as coaches through intentional goal setting, ongoing observation and reflection alongside the educator, 
we can use this uh, strength-based approach to help change practice. With educator practice, we're also considering how educators support children's growth with developmentally and culturally relevant experiences that they create. And the final pillar of the framework is complexities of the coaching ecosystem. This section considers both the interpersonal systems and the complexities of the coaching work. Sometimes resistance can feel very obvious and other times it may be a little more difficult to understand and appreciate where the resistance is coming from. Resistance needs to be placed within the larger context of uh, sphere for readiness. So really thinking about where an educator is and their understanding of reflective practice Will impact how they will impact directly impact their ability to acknowledge the need for change. How we figure out what issues to address for ourselves and for the educators we support is a really challenging part of the work. There are so many competing issues that arise in the course of a teaching life, and beyond the educator's stated goals, how a coach helps co-construct a hierarchy of issues can be and how these can be addressed is really where the work is. Uh, we're also conflicted because as uh, Virginia mentioned, there isn't time for everything. So knowing that there isn't time for everything, how are you prioritizing that time together? Um, thank you, Millie. Thank you, Virginia, for that uh, run through. Um, let me do a little tech magic here to pin our speakers for the next section. Done. We are gonna dive into our panel discussion now. All right, and you should see all of our panelists here on your screen. Um, again, thank you, Millie and Virginia for that introduction to the framework. I think you've offered our audience a lot to think about in a short amount of time. I know we really flew through that and I hope you all kind of are able to look at the framework as, as well as we have this discussion today. Um, but we all know that the framework is only the beginning. It's really how we use the framework in practice where change happens. So with that in mind, um, we are going to turn to some questions to help deepen our understanding of the framework's design and how folks can use it in action. So our first question is for you, Virginia. Um, can you talk about how the framework is informed by Bank Street's approach to edu educator preparation in the Graduate School of Education? Um, and how is this framework similar or different to approaches used in the graduate school? Sure. Um, well, a key aspect of the framework is helping educators develop an awareness of their how their own experiences of being parented and taught is part of your unconscious and work to striving to make those feelings and experiences more conscious in order to unpack its relevance for your work. So the graduate school certainly promotes that kind of thinking um, and work, but I would say that understanding and making meaning of children's behaviors um, comes first for beginning teachers. Uh, it's not that that isn't a part of it, but you know, where do you start? <laughs> you can't do it all at once. Um, so it's a, it's a question of emphasis, not different or similar as much. Um, and the other thing I would just say is that um, the ability to reserve judgment um, also mirrors principles in the graduate school. Um, it takes most adult learners a very long time um, to remove that fear of being judged. I re referred to this before. Um, just because it's so deeply ingrained in us. Yes, thank you, Virginia. I appreciate that as a former teacher. And I remember when my coaches would come into the classroom, I would often feel very anxious <laughs> as though I was being judged. And so I think that um, breaking that down is such an important part of being able to build that um, coach educator relationship. Um, you all bring really extensive experience coaching educators directly, but then also supporting the professional growth and development of other coaches. Um, so could you each offer some examples of the ways in which your coaching experience influenced the development of the framework or how the framework kind of informs your, your work now? Um, Millie, let's start with you. Sure. Um, I would say my previous experience in both being a coach and leading coaching work at scale, uh, there were key learnings along the way that influenced my thinking on what it means to be a reflective and responsive coach. 
And this mostly evolved from ongoing conversations with educators that continuously highlighted that there was something different about having a coach that was exposed to this framework. When we dug a little deeper into what that meant, we realized that educators were referring to actions of feeling seen and heard by their coach. This was exemplified by small things such as checking in with the educator before a coaching session or celebrating a child's learning milestone that was impacted by the educator's support and tracking goals in a way that felt organic and authentic to the coaching process. The impetus of these actions that educators highlight really came down to relationships and the understanding of de adult development. And that's mostly how we saw the framework show up um, in our work at scale. It also showed up for professional development as well. Um, although there is a more sort of group approach uh, when you're working in professional learning sessions, the, the values of the framework and the DIA are still there. Thanks, Millie. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm so happy to be here with all of you and with this great team. Um, I'm Christina. So to answer um, your question, Annie, so for me, um, as a coach, whether it's for um, teachers, home visitors, graduate students, um, our goal is always to meet people where they are professionally. Um, and to do this, we really need to have shared goals around how we view um, and treat young children and their caregivers and how we approach education. Um, so as mentioned before, um, also having space for reflection is key. So without that, um, this framework, which um, has the developmental interaction approach as its foundations, is deeply rooted in relationships. So relationships to the environment, to children, to families, to colleagues. Um, and really because of that, um, I really see that the framework helps support both the coach and the coachees um, in growing where they want to grow um, and to open space for them to think about areas for growth um, that they may not have thought about. Um, so as, as a coach, I also see it as a tool to help um, my coaching skills move forward um, as I am making sure that I'm tapping into all of those key um, sort of um, approaches that um, Virginia had laid out in the framework. Um, so, and then in this way, both the coach um, and those being coached are in that parallel process that we, that we speak about, right? We're learning together. Um, and, and then a community or a culture of learning then is grown out of that um, because everybody then becomes a learner um, and there's space, um, you've created space and time to grow together. Um, I'm gonna answer your question sort of personally for my own development as a professional going way back. Um, and I'll say that um, I'm basically an impatient person and I've had to um, consciously work at having patience. Um, in a professional way, and it's it's served me well, um, and it's it's allowed me to lessen my judgments by trying to think about why an educator might be following a particular path. Um, I'm still not so patient in the rest of my life, but anyway, um, and the way I've been able to develop in this direction really came from my early years at, at Bank Street as a junior faculty member, where I experienced non-judgmental mentors and an ongoing regular uh you know we meeting weekly group reflective process for advisors so we had a deeply rooted parallel process going on and i'm aware of how long it took me to change my headset so it hasn't been lost on me in doing my work with educators um, and coaches throughout my career and i'm just going to give a quick example so when i first work worked with um, programs that had box curriculum, fixed curriculum. My first impulse was to make uh, a pretty stern judgment about it. Um, and we spent a lot of time as a group thinking about why and how that curriculum was there and how we could work with it. Um, 
And you have to be patient to do that. Yes, thank you, Virginia. And thank you all. I, I really like what I'm hearing about this kind of parallel process coming through, how the teachers are learning, but then it's also important for the coaches to have that space for really learning about their own practice and reflecting on it and growing as well. Um, Virginia, you were the primary author of our coaching framework. Can you tell us a bit about how you made choices about what you included in the framework um, and what you highlighted given your experiences with coaching and supporting other coaches? Sure, it was messy <laughs> at first, um, but I think the most helpful thing was identifying those four pillars as an organizer um, and clearly ways of being is the pillar that most programs need help with um, uh, across the country, I, I would say. Um, and once we had a rough working idea of the who, the what was kind of the next obvious step. Um, I would just say briefly that um, based on my experience, going for the hard issues was kind of a given. Things like Millie referred to the continuum of resistance. Um, and how, like, for example, how does a coach even know that what they're picking up is resistance? And if so, how aware is the teacher even that they are having persistence? And given that all that's true, how honest um, and not confrontational, but direct or indirect um, should the coach be? Um, it's really how do you, as Millie talked about, how do you enter that continuum of resistance? And then finally, I just, as a coach, I really value um, telling stories. So professional self um, entered the framework that way. Thank you. Um, and I do want to remind everyone in the audience that we will have time for your questions. So if folks have questions about the framework or about approaches to coaching more generally, please feel free to drop them in the chat and I'm sure our panelists will be happy to answer them. Um, now we're going to turn to some of the challenges that come up through implementation of a framework like this um, and how to use frameworks to support coaches in their work with educators. Um, so as we've talked about as a coach, you have to balance an educator's need for really quick answers while also building their own ability to be able to observe their practice and reflect and find their own answers. Um, so Christina, we'll, we'll start with you for this question. Can you speak about the ways in which needing a right answer um, comes up for educators and what advice do you have for coaches when they're, when they're running into that? Yeah, sure. Great question. Thank you. Um, so I think we've we've spoken about how we all know educators um, have very little time in their day, um, and it's sort of natural to want that quick answer or quick fix to things. Um, however, one of the starting points to really establishing and building um, a relationship is making sure that everyone feels okay with not having the right answer or a quick fix. Um, but instead to feel comfortable problem solving together um, and trying out solutions um, and then dedicating time to reflect on why something worked out and didn't work out. Um, and that's tricky with the lack of time. Um, you know, as a director, I will um, prioritize as much as anything else um, time during the week to make sure that reflections can happen. Um, so, you know, that's sort of one piece is, is really putting in the time for the staff um, in their weekly schedule to do that. Um, and remembering what Virginia mentioned earlier is um, really working on not making assumptions about children, families, educators, um, because there is no one size fits all, right? So. Um, you, you can't have quick fixes if you come from a place of, of not really making assumptions. Um, however, as we gain more experience using the framework um, along with reflective practices, we all become more skilled in finding solutions quicker together. So it's not that it can't sort of evolve and become a quicker process, um, but you know, like anything, it sort of takes time and we talk about um, flexing those reflective practices um, and then things sort of happen quicker. Um, 
So, you know, in that way, a big part of um, sort of team meetings and learning communities is to share strategies and stories. Um, and that way we see the work as sort of a narrative rather than, you know, a one size fits all or a sort of multiple choice, right? Right or wrong, right or wrong answer. So, thank you. Virginia, did you did you have anything to add? Well, I, I just wanted to say that I love how you said, Christina, that the process, you know, gets better. And as it gets better, it can also go a little faster. And I think that's true. Right? But I never articulated it that way to myself. Anyway, it's 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 clearly one of the toughest nuts to crack. Um, I think, uh, you know, obviously, coaches have to guide an educator's process in a way that relates directly to an issue at hand and not come in with their own agenda. Um, support is key word. Um, building confidence, you know, takes time working towards a breakthrough while supporting things that may feel less successful. Um, and, you know, just because we're emphasizing reflective practice doesn't mean a coach never provides solutions to an educator. Um, you know, it's about the process and how and helping the teacher first try things out. Um, but I think at the end of each visit, it's important for the educator to walk away with something, whether it's a new idea, a question, something to try out, you know, just to feel that they've not only been heard and seen, but received something. Yeah, thank you. And Millie, have you observed this dynamic of needing to find kind of the right answer in your work with coaches um, who have been using this framework in their practice? Yeah, I think this question is an interesting one uh, because it really is a parallel process. And we've been saying that throughout our time together because it really is true. And using the framework, sometimes it could be challenging to encourage an educator to take some time to consider the layers of a challenge or a question or a goal that they have set and what might be the source of the problem or the question they're presenting, uh, especially if it ties back to development, identity, and culture. That is a lot of self-work that um, does not happen in a vacuum. And so as a coach, we see and experience this as well, right? In the same way that we support educators in going through this process, as coaches, it is important um, to really have someone to hold you as well as you do the work to understand how your own development identity and culture impact the relationship. So it really is in this scenario important to balance that supporting practical approaches when apl applicable with time and really consider all of the possible solutions. The goal when working with educators is to really use the framework to build that reflective muscle so that educators can grow in their ability and confidence to problem solve when they, when they no longer have a coach. And then really thinking about that parallel process as a coach, you actually need to go through that process as well. So making sure you have time to actually reflect, whether that's journaling, whether that's another coach that you're sharing sort of, sort of your thinking process with, whether it's a coach supervisor or someone in a leadership position that's supporting you through that process. It really is important to carve out that time to help build that reflective muscle so you can really hold space for educators as well. Thank you, Millie. Um, Shifting gears a little bit, but still kind of focusing on this implementation question, um, I, I would love to take some time to think about how this framework can be applied to coaching uh, family child care educators. And Christina, um, I know you've previously worked with educators in family child care. Uh, can you speak to how this framework could be implemented in, in those settings as well? Yeah, sure. So, um... You know, we all talk about sort of having time and space, and I think family child care providers understand this to the a, thou a, a thousandth degree, right? Um, they're the ones really with the least amount of, of time and space putting in, um, you know, extra hours um, and dedication. Um, but I believe that the framework can be used with um, any educator, and that includes family child care providers. Um, because the framework um, can really help and sort of frame the focus around goals um, that they have for their programs, um, 
I think that would act as a huge support. Um, so there's often with any program, many goals to focus on at the same time. Um, and I think the framework um, is sort of that containment um, of, of um, how you focus on, on the goals and, and what you focus on. Um, and that's especially helpful when there's sort of um, less time to do that. Um, the framework also, um, I think, really supports the conversations, um, you know, a range of conversations, right? So conversations that you might have with families, um, conversations that you might have with other staff members, um, you know, so you can sort of take the framework to um, strengthen the relationships that you're working on within your program. Um, you know, and the, the other piece too is that really, which is a structural issue, I think, for everybody, but is really building in those structures for learning communities. Um, when I worked with family child care providers, even though they were working very long hours, they really appreciated having learning communities where, you know, many of them could come together to talk about a shared concern or a shared goal. Um, and, you know, the, the framework again, as, um, you know, as sort of a foundation for these conversations, I think could be um, really helpful in, in pushing um, quality um, of, of relationships and of programs. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, I, I appreciate that because family child care providers are often so isolated. And so I love that idea of kind of bringing them together in those learning communities to be able to do that reflection um, with other folks. Now, my next question is for Millie first, and she is still here and just has lost her pin. So I'm just gonna bring her back. Um, might just spotlight, no, there we are. Um, <laughs> so a lot of folks in our audience represent systems or organizations that might be implementing coaching and they want to adopt or adapt this framework in their own practice, kind of at that systems level. Um, can you talk about the conditions that you think are required for successful implementation of this approach? Sure, sure, Annie. And I think as part of adopting this framework in any system, it's really important to consider three conditions. Our first one you might've heard over the course of our time together is time. <laughs> time for actual meaningful reflection um, and professional development. Uh, the reflection, whether individually or in small groups, such as professional learning communities are just as valuable. When educators have protected time to reflect on their practice through journaling or responding to reflective prompts, they're able to continuously build that reflective practice by processing in small groups uh, or in professional learning communities. The second condition is to really continuous, continually deepen your own understanding of child and adult development and how to use this in everyday work. One of the reoccurring noticings we hear from coaches is the challenges of bridging theory and practice when they're working with educators. So being able to have a deep understanding of child and adult development and support educators in that is really key. And the last condition is uh, coaches are needing, uh, needing to be willing to learn how to process their own judgments of others, teaching practice and investigate the origins of their biases. As Virginia mentioned earlier, the importance of understanding development, identity and culture is really grounded in one's ability to understand how your own biases impact the coaching relationship. Together, these three conditions can really set the foundation for reflect, reflective practice to take root. Thank you, Millie. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's, I, as I'm listening to this conversation, I feel like what I'm hearing come through over and over again is this like openness from both the coach and the, the educator um, to change and, and to kind of honestly looking at ourselves. So thank you for that. Um, and then in terms of policy, it. it at scale, it seems like, again, creating that time is the big one, like finding ways where you can really create time for teachers and coaches to have that reflective space is so important. Um, Virginia, is there anything else you would like to add to that? Yeah, yeah I would just, I agree with everything Millie said, um, <laughs> um, but I think organizations really need to find out what the coaches want to learn. 
um, and not make assumptions, you know, ask them. They may not, the, the whole framework may not be so helpful to everyone, but maybe a part of it is. So, um, you know, find out what coaches need too, not just educators uh, in classrooms. Mm, yeah, that, that is a great point. Thank you. Um, and then we have one final kind of question. We have some a question coming in through the chat. Um, so we'll, we'll turn to those questions next. Um, but Christina, I'm kind of wondering, as we think about applying this to different contexts, you're currently leading a home visitor program. How could you imagine using the framework um, in that context? Yeah, so, um, you know, again, I think it's it's not that different from, um, from sort of other programs. Um, the one piece with like a home-based program where they're home visiting, um, there's there's an added element of sort of um, intimacy, right? You're going into somebody's home. Um, so I think really that the assumptions and the biases, um, family culture is um, sort of amplified um, as you're really working in somebody's private space, right? Which is their home. Um, but again, the framework um, allows and um, sort of organizes um, ways of approaching, right? These different elements with, um, with the home visitors. Um, and not every home visitor is gonna be in the same place, right? As, as we would expect. Um, and as any of you who work in Head Start um, or in education at the moment, there's a huge turnover, right, of staff. Um, so, you know, when you're working with a framework that is sort of fluid, it allows you to continue your coaching and continue your coaching model, even as you may have, um, you know, turnover of staff. Um, but again, you know, we can create more minutes and more hours in the day as much as we want all this time and space. But I think um, what Millie mentioned is um, protected time. I like that, <laughs> you know, um, time. Um, and I would say prioritizing, right? So prioritizing um, that um, this is as important as lesson planning or as, you know, X, Y, and Z. Um, so, um, so yeah, I think that's, yeah, pretty much it. Awesome. Thank you, Christina. Um, I'll turn now to a question that we have in the chat, which I think is something we've all wrestled with in these different projects. So I, I, I think it's a great question. Um, the question comes from Elisa. I'm curious about how you might think about assessing uh, what some call the impact of coaching. How can we make coaching slash learning visible, um, especially to those who don't already see and experience it? So how do we communicate kind of the power of coaching and, and its effectiveness? Um, how do you all think about that? Yes, important question for funding. It is also a sticky one. Well, I think there, I think there are two different questions, right? One is how you assess; the other is how you help other people see its importance. Um, but I, I think that you know, you you need to be able to document. I mean, part of coaching is helping educators document their work and educate and the coaches need to document that the ways they're doing that so i think there needs to be a way that um you know people can without getting a huge grant because that's very hard um you know code um different kinds of learning and changes over time and i would add to that that sometimes the word assess can feel like a bad word when we're, when we're talking about uh, relationship-based approaches. But really, when you break that down, it's a little bit of what Virginia is saying, right? Is how do you document that process of learning together so that it feels authentic and, trans and transparent, right? The documentation process should not be a hidden process. It should be a shared process where everyone is exchanging information in relation to the goal that you've set together. So in turn, that documentation actually is very valuable data that could be and feed into 
an assessment process that still centers sort of human connection at its core, but also speaks to the powerful impact of coaching work. I'll just, um, one last thing I would say in terms of, which I agree with the data and the assessment, um, is thinking of um, programmatic data. Um, from my experience, um, there was an increase or a decrease, I should say, in staff turnover once we started coaching. Um, and that's huge for any program, um, right, is retaining and keeping staff um, because they feel seen, because they feel heard, um, and because they feel respected um, in their work. So I think that's um, another huge um, data piece, really, that, that could be um, I would expect to see across programs that use coaching. Yes, great point. Thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, let's see. I saw another question in the chat. Okay, so someone is asking, so I appreciate the encouragement to have patience and give time for growth and development. Um, but many of us work in urgent environments where educators are under a range of real pressures. Um, can you talk about how you've managed to create that space and also balance uh, the reality of these realities? Well, I'll just say two quick things. One is prioritize time. And the, the other is create excitement so that people begin to see the value. And then they create little pockets of time. It, it's so hard. I mean, <laughs> there is there is no right answer. <laughs> and I would add to that, um, that we do need to validate that we are in, a, in times where time is, is, is limited in many instances, yet there is a sense of urgency around the work that we do. And it's a little bit of holding both that urgency and the space to actually do that work. So that when you are sitting together with your coachee, sometimes even having that, those five minutes where you know, a coachee may be venting a little bit, or maybe they're just going through a really tough time and they need to clear a static for themselves and you're holding space for that person can be enough to start creating the space that you need for them to do some of that deep work. Because while there is always a sense of urgency in our work, what we've understood or began to understand in, in the use of this framework is that if you move too quickly before doing that identity and development work for yourself, you can actually cause harm in the long run, not only to yourself, but to the children um, in your program. So it really is about holding a little bit of both that sense of urgency. Yes, there are always things to do. And at the same time, slowing down enough to sort of just check in with the parts of ourself that are really impacting the work and need to be attended to. Yeah, and I'd, um, I'd just add following up, right, that there, if you're able to see it as, as a priority, right, you may be able to chunk out 30 minutes a week, right, to focus on this. If not, um, as Millie is saying, there are these mini teachable moments. I remember when I was being coached um, and I was also right practicing being a coach myself. Um, and I was like, oh, but how can I, you know, give the support to so many staff members? I don't have the time. And I remember my coaching, it's two minutes, right? Two minutes um, a day, you know. One, one sort of I notice statement for each staff member, if you add it up, really, it feels like a lot. And then when you break it down, right, it's always sort of that, it feels like that big mountain. But then if you break down the tasks into little little pieces, it feels more manageable. Um, and I, I just remember that helping me a lot um, to sort of getting the, the ball rolling, really, instead of feeling sort of stagnant and overwhelmed by it. Thank you. Um, gosh, thank you all so much. I really appreciate um, all of you sharing your expertise with us today. Um, I think there was one more question that we could kind of do as a lightning round if you all have resources in mind. 
Someone asked, um, what can you recommend coaches read or do to learn more about adult de development and stages of educator development? Do you all have like a, a resource in mind that might be helpful or any tips on that? You know, I, I can't think of an exact reading right now at the moment, but there's there's a lot of good stuff out there. I think, you know, starting a little study group, it doesn't have to meet that often and um, doing some research to find just starting off with one reading mm -hmm. or bring in someone who can talk about it and go from there, you know, integrating the issues that, you know, the, the questions you have about adult development. It's really important. It's just so neglected. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would add we've in our recent coaching work have also used um, some of Elena Aguilar's work in the art of coaching. I think she does a great job of balancing the understanding of adult development and how that impacts coaching. Um, so book studies around that. She also has one for teaching teams for those of you who have programs where you're working with educators um, in teams. And so yeah, I think that's a, a recent resource that comes to mind. Awesome. Thank you both. All right, we're going to wrap up with that because we only have three minutes left. Um, again, we want to thank everyone who joined us today. We had folks from a wide kind of cross section of the early childhood space, um, folks that are educators, coaches, systems leaders, policymakers. We appreciate all of you being here today. Um, we hope that our presentation has inspired you to take a closer look at our coaching framework and giving you a bit of a glimpse um, into Bank Street's approach um, applied to coaching. We do have a survey that we would love you all to fill out if you could to um, kind of inform our, our webinars and make sure that um, we're addressing what, what you need and um, prov providing a, a useful resource for you. Um, we also welcome you to reach out to the Learning Starts at Birth team um, if you have any feedback or additional questions about the tool. Our Ed Center is also available to support partners who are strengthening uh, their coaching or building an approach to coaching. So please save the email that's up on the screen here and feel free to connect with us at any time. Um, and within about a week, we should have a recording of this posted to our website if you'd like to share it with any of your colleagues. So with that, thanks again to Millie, Christina, and Virginia for joining us today. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise. Um, and offering your insights. And we hope everyone has a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank and we'll, you. we'll stay on so you have some time to fill out that feedback survey. Thank you. So click that link and fill out that survey. <laughs>